Sergeant Paul Ray Pipes, United States Army, Korea, the Forgotten War. Paul's one of my Texas veterans. I interviewed him in Brennan, Texas, January 6, 2010. Paul served in the Korean War at Heartbreak Ridge and Bloody Ridge. He was a sergeant. He fought on the front lines because he was a good shot. And he thanked God after the battles that he made it through and asked and prayed that he would live to be an old man. Well, Paul just recently passed away six weeks ago, end of January, and he's buried at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. He died at the age of 94. Paul was about 82 when I interviewed him. And just a great story from Korea. Oh my gosh, folks, I know a lot of you are learning a lot. Some of you didn't know anything about the Korean War. And that's my challenge to our younger generation as they watch these films and listen to the Voices of History radio station too, folks. Paul's story is gonna be featured there. It's featured here and it just, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share these stories. I wanna thank especially Brandon Glidden. Brandon, love you brother, salute you. Thank you for making it possible for others to hear Paul's story and for your continued support of my work. Thank you so much. Like I said, Paul's story is also being featured on my Voices of History radio channel that I started just a couple of weeks ago. I'm so excited, can you tell? I'm gonna make a major announcement, but we can download the apps on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. It's not currently on the Google Play Store as of today, March the 19th, but it will be this week. So um, you can go to my website, larrycapetto.com. You can watch or listen to the stories there. And I just want to plug the radio station. I know that's a, probably a special group of people. I'm reaching out to truck drivers and our children, our students in our schools. At your, in your hands, at your fingertips, folks, young people, you have now living history, spanning over 80 years of history. You have these stories 24 hours a day on Voices of History Radio. You need to take an opportunity and uh, listen. If I was a teacher, I would have you download the app, listen to two or three stories, do a book report, Folks, this is a great way to teach our kids about the freedoms that we have. How they were born in a free country, they know nothing really about our freedoms or why we're free. This radio station is there for you. So I love my YouTube channel and I, now I love my Voices of History radio channel. So I'd like to encourage those of you watching this video to sponsor a story. I have, so, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories, folks, in my archives and, and they're just waiting for you to sponsor a veteran. And you can do so by clicking on the link in the video description or go to my website, larrycapetto.com, where the radio station's featured also. Click on Sponsor a Vet and just see the pictures of my veterans and just decide which one you want and include their name in the sponsorship. If you want to just donate to my work, you can do so in the comment section of this video. I know you keep hearing this over and over again, but I don't monetize these videos. There's no commercials, no interruptions. I don't think that's right, it's disrespectful. So we, we're doing it this way. The, the radio stations, listeners support it. I encourage you to please donate. You can do that from my website or from the app. So I'm excited folks. Paul Pipes, God bless you, sir. Thank you for letting me interview you. You're a wonderful man and I'm so glad to be able to share your story now on my channel. Please subscribe to this channel folks and share this video and I'll be talking to you soon. God bless you. My birthday. That's really good, man. Well, thank you. I, I still get around real well. My army buddies uh, get so disgusted with me. They all have hearing aids, you know, and, and they want to know how many bypasses I've had. I said, I've never had. Matter of fact, I went to a eye doctor the other day, and the little old gal said, Now, Mr. Price, fill out all the operations you've ever had. And I just handed the paper back to her, and she said, No, 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 now. I'm talking about for anything ever. I said, I've never had an operation for anything. She said, are you kidding me? How old are you? And she asked me the same thing you did. And I said, well, I'll be 82 on my birthday. 
And she said, I cannot believe that. And I said, well, when a doctor cuts on me, it's going to be the first time, you know. And that's the truth, if I ever told it. I've never... And I've got... The doctor said, your eyes are amazing for a man of your age. This one corrected to 2020, and this one's 2030, 2040, or something. Anyway, he said, you do just doggone good, you know. No hearing aids. And they say, why aren't you deaf like we are, you know. But the reason, and I'll tell you the reason, I had ear trouble, and my mother just worried about me. She said, always, and my sister, every time they would send me a package, it'd be some kind of a little old wool tam thing to put over my head underneath my helmet, and I always kept that, and it, I guess it cut out a lot of that noise. That, You know, war is the noisiest dang thing. It's just amazing. We played soldiers, and then when I got there, and uh, I did my training at Camp Roberts, California, and they uh, put me in a heavy weapons outfit, and we started out laying down by the side of a little air-cooled 30 caliber machine gun and firing that thing, and they were telling us, you know, you can burn this up in the New York minute, but the water-cooled ones, if you'll use your head, you can fire those things indefinitely, and they'll never get too hot. But that bang, 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 and it, when you'd be feeding the ammunition into it, or whether you were firing it, the noise would just make your ears hurt. And they never said anything about protect your ears or anything back in the 50s. They just didn't do that, you know. And that's why so many of them are deaf, but they just were real upset. All my old army buddies, why don't you have hearing aids? I said, I don't need them, you know. Tell me what year you joined. Were you drafted? I was drafted. What uh, year, 51 or what? It was 52. And it was, it was uh, I'd say I went into the Army in July or August because I remember it was the hottest part of the year. And when I got to Camp Roberts, uh, I remember those city boys would be out there trying to, uh, it had a big parade ground and it was, uh, we'd have to double time across it, you know, jogging and uh, I'd just see them just fall out, just fall out and hit that pavement like they are dead, you know, that old blacktop and little old country boy and worked hard, you know, and chased squirrels and deer and rabbits, anything I could shoot down through. My dad had a pretty big place and uh, it was my job to keep the fences all kind of halfway taken care of. So I was in good shape and shoot, that was all kind of, wasn't fun, but it wasn't any work like it was for some of those city guys, you know. Tell me about when you first went to Korea, what you experienced in country and, and what you remember about that experience. Well, the funny thing about it, once I got into the Army, they flew us from San Antonio right to Camp Roberts and we started training. And as soon as we got through our training and then they took some guys that they had tested that tested pretty big and they said, okay, we want you to be officers. But the trouble was you had to, once you got out of basic training, go to advanced leadership school. Then once you got from there, go to OCS. And then when you got through, re-up for three years. And I said, shoot, that's going to be over four years. I'm not doing this. I'm just going to take my two years now. And they said, well, buddy, I'm going to tell you two things. Rank is frozen. If you go to leadership school, you'll be a PFC when you go in and be a corporal when you come out. And that's it. You're not going to get a promotion. And I said, you know, I'm going to be in for two years. What difference does it make? So uh, when we got through with our uh, training at Camp Roberts, they put us on planes again. And we went to Hawaii, Wake Island, and then we landed at Haneda Air Base in, uh, in Tokyo. And they got us right on over there and put us on a train and up to this forward replacement deal. And, of course, they were telling us, you know, you guys are given live ammunition from now on. You've got to be it. You're going to be the master of your own soul, and you stay alert, and you watch. And a lot of you will come back. Now, I'm not going to promise you all of you will because you're not, but you'll stand a heck of a lot better chance if you'll stay alert, you know. Well, Lord, uh, we started up to the front on these trucks and hadn't gone very far until I saw this sign that said, Impact, a caution, impact area, keep a 50 yard interval. And I was standing there looking at that truck, what's an impact? And I could see these huge holes as big as this room and about two feet deep. And I heard this awful sounding noise coming and bam, one of those artillery rounds hit not too far from that truck. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna be killed before I ever get where I'm going. And uh, I'll never even make it to the front. But we got on up there a little ways and this old driver made a left turn, and he said, Pipes, he stopped and said, Pipes, get off. And I jumped off, and he drove off, left me standing there. And I thought, where in God's world am I? And I saw this uh, lieutenant out there driving down aiming stakes and setting uh, up, up a mortar station there. 
And I went over and I said, sir, excuse me, am I supposed to report to you? And he said, no, I've got all my men. And he said, all right, guys, get those aiming stakes driven down. And he, you know, and I said, sir, excuse me, that truck drove up here and dumped me off and just drove off. What am I supposed to do? Is that the front I'm seeing up there? He said, son, that's Heartbreak Ridge. You'll be up there tomorrow. And I said, well, it's not that far. I'll just walk on up there because it's like, it, if you saw that movie, Heartbreak Ridge, that's exactly what I was looking at there. And he said, you wouldn't get halfway up there. You'd be dead. He said, now go on down that road to that CP and check in there and they'll tell you what to do. And I went on down there and I thought, my Lord, they could kind of broke me in kind of light, but they didn't just up to Heartbreak Ridge and boom, there I was. Well, the next day, this warrant officer took me on up to the front. And he said, we'll probably get snipers shot today. And he said, boy, this is going to be... This will be neat. And I thought, you know, is this guy nuts? What? And what he was trying to do was get enough of combat time in to qualify for the combat infantry badge. Well, that didn't mean anything to me. But anyway, I thought, you know, this guy's nuts. Well, he took me on up to a machine gun emplacement and said, you're going to be a part of this machine gun crew here, which I, I said, well, I've had training on it. And uh, when my papers caught up with me and they saw I'd gone to leadership school, they sent me on up to Bloody Ridge, which is even really a little bit nastier than Heartbreak Ridge. I found out from experience up there as a section leader. And I had, I think, two or three water-cooled 30 machine guns and a 50 caliber air-cooled machine gun and a recoilless rifle. And some of those pictures that you saw, that was, that was uh, Bloody Ridge. That's where I was, on Bloody Ridge there. And I guess I did a fairly good job because uh, Sergeant D uh, Eighth, when they pulled him out for some other deal, sent me back down to the CP as the platoon sergeant. And I was still just a corporal because, like I told you, rank was frozen and you just didn't, you didn't go beyond a corporal in the non-commissioned officers. And so I did that. And we pulled off of the lines uh, and went back to the rear for uh, doing, uh, replacing men and, and, and resting a little bit. You know, in Korea, you've probably, your dad maybe told you this, we would go sometimes 20 or 30 days. We didn't even take our clothes off. We didn't take a bath. We just would sleep in a sleeping bag with our shoes, our boots and everything. And we just learned to just, I had a, a ammunition belt and on one side of it, I had this spoon and a little old clip. And we'd eat out of these sea rations. And the way I'd clean my spoon, I'd wipe it off on my shirt. And we'd eat our sea rations. And then I'd lick it, get it clean, wipe it off on my shirt, and hook it back down there, you know. And so uh, that, was, that was what we... And you could go down on a rare occasion and get down uh, and meet a, a chow truck that would be coming in and... Uh, so uh, we would do that maybe once every three days or something, but we normally would eat these sea rations, and it was pork and beans and, and this uh, corned beef hash. And I could never could figure out what that was, a bunch of grease with some meat, ground up meat in it. And, but it was, you know, it would sustain us. And uh, we would get a dry ration, a box of, it, they'd come in a container just like a box of uh, goods that you'd open with 24 or whatever it was in it, I don't remember, but uh, we'd each get us two or three cans out of there and we'd eat them and then we'd get another box and, and go down and then we had a, a, a dry ration box and it had some uh, little round biscuits that was cocoa and powdered milk and uh, sugar and you could mix that with water and if you, we, we had this stove we would make out of a 50 caliber ammunition deal we'd just shoot holes through it so it would be ventilated and those natives would make us charcoal and bring in little old bags up there and we'd heat our sea rations well in the winter time you had to heat them because they were usually frozen you couldn't probably have ate the darn things out of the box out of the can unless you heated them up and so we'd punch a couple of holes in it where it wouldn't swell up and pop and heat it on top of that little homemade stove we'd make out of those 50 caliber ammunition deals that worked out real good you know and uh, I, I sometimes wonder, now that I'm back home and, and thinking about it, we didn't go home at night and sleep in a bed. We didn't have a home to go to. We'd make these little old bitty uh, bunkers that was about 
half as big as this room or a fourth as big as this room and we'd have a little old place, a ledge there that we'd have a sleeping bag and one would sleep while the other one would be on the gun or whatever and my little buddy a lot of nights would come and uh, relieve me on the gun or I'd relieve him or whatever and if he'd make chocolate uh, cocoa out of his little old deal, he'd leave half of it for me and he'd say, uh, and, and everyone called me sergeant. I was just a corporal but I was the platoon sergeant. They'd say, sergeant, left you some coffee and or cocoa or whatever he had made, you know, and this worked out real good too. And uh, getting back to those pictures there on Bloody Ridge, you saw those sandbags. That was our steps going up right to the top of the ridge. Well, I had a 75 recoilless rifle mounted just kind of like that deal there up at the top, and we'd fire fire missions from up there. And I was sitting there, and one of the pictures shows me kind of digging around in this little old bunker like. That was where our ammo was, and we'd carry that and go up there and have fire missions. And I was right there from here to closer than to where we came in. And to the that was the main line of resistance, the MLR there. That we lived up there. We just lived up there right on through the winter and snow. And I used to show my wife pictures of it. I'd say, "Boy, how do you like this uh, beautiful sand over there in Korea?" And she'd say, "You can't fool me. I've heard you talk about how cold it was over there." And it was. It would get cold, and but we just, we made it. We just stayed out there, and in addition to having to fight the darn cold, we had to fight the, mostly the Chinese, because by the time I got over there, they had ran out of North Koreans, and China had told them, you know, we'll send troops, and we got to notice, and we weren't fighting North Koreans. We were fighting a different breed of dog, so to speak, and recognized that that was the Chinese that we were actually fighting over there, and mostly it was Chinese from then on, you know. I'm going to get back to the cold now. Okay. Um, I've done a film on, on the Korean War and the Chosen Reservoir and, and, and what they experienced, the Marines and the, and the Army. Right, right. But, but, I mean, the first two gentlemen I talked to today, um, heavy weapons, uh, Korea, the cold. I, I live in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes pretend when I'm walking in the cold and the snow, like, what if I had to find a place to sleep tonight? That's it. I would die. Mm -hmm. how, how did you guys, I mean, you talk, you talk like it, it what happened, but... When, it, when you were going through it, were you just so young and naive, you just... Well, we had sleeping orders? bags, and, and we would... Uh, our front door on our sleeping bunkers, we would have a fighting bunker, and then we would have a, a little old, uh, bunker that we would build into the side of the hill down below where we would sleep. Now, some of the guys would build their sleeping bunker right there with their machine guns and so forth and would sleep right up there, but... Uh, it naturally had to have an aperture, so that was open facing right to the north. And on the back side, we'd take a shelter half and we'd kind of, like this would be the door out, we'd go beyond it and have a, uh, another thing of uh, sandbags so that you'd go out there and then go out that door and, and, and avoid just coming right in on you there, you know. And uh, we'd hang that shelter half, that was our door. And it would get down close to zero and uh, 10, 12 above, and I mean, it stayed that way for days. We just, just survived it. I don't, I, we had good warm mittens and they'd have a, a trigger finger on it. And we had these old caps that had these wool deals and I'd tie mine down around my head and stick that shelter half and then that helmet on top of it. And uh, we had uh, coats that had a little old, uh, fur lining on the top of it for the collar and it's just halfway. We just lived out there. We didn't freeze. We wore those gloves all the time. Uh, a lot of times if we would get involved in real heated combat, a lot of times I'd take my one that I, I'd take it off because I didn't want that glove bothering me, you know, when you'd be trying to load a M1 rifle or whatever. And Do you remember the first time you got into combat in Korea, what you experienced? Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, we, uh, I, the first combat experience I had, and it was the strangest thing. You learned to know what was going on in combat by sounds. For instance, uh, you could hear one night, I can give you an example of what I'm talking about. One night, we heard this awful commotion down there, and uh, there was a valley between uh, Bloody Ridge and Heartbreak Ridge. It was Sattery Valley. And at night, they would send men out there all along that uh, old, damp, nasty, wet valley. Well, one night, one of the first fracases we got into, 
there was a patrol came from Easy Company up there and they got lost. They went back in there and got lost and they kept coming down and coming down. When they hit Saturday Valley, they just started following it because they knew they'd make it back to the lines. And they'd been out there a couple of days. We always would have a password. And the password was play and the, the cosign was ball. Then the next day it was Marilyn Monroe. Well, these guys realized finally that they, because you could listen to the sounds, it was M1 and M2 carbines shooting against one another. And you could tell those old Russian burp guns, you know, a carbine would fire real fast, but those old Russian burp guns just vrrt, 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 just like that, you know, and you didn't hear it. So we finally it dawned on somebody, you know, we're shooting at our own men, and somebody hollered, Marilyn. And so this patrol, uh, picked right up on that, and this guy was so excited, he said, hey, Marilyn Monroe, let's play ball, and everybody went to laughing, you know. Well, the only person that got shot, it was a bunch of new guys up there. Of course, a lot of us were new uh, replacements, and they were up there trying to hide and just holding up and shooting, and one of them got his thumb shot off. That was the only casualty in the whole bunch, and that was, to me, it was kind of funny, but then they would have real Chinese that would come down through there and we'd get in a fight with them. And yeah, you were, I was scared out of my dang tracks a lot of the time. I would be just really frightened, you know. And uh, I remember going up on Bloody Ridge and being in those trenches and those guys that pour in there on us. And I was scared as hell. Now, I don't mind telling you, I, I was supposed to have been a corporal and a leader and a section leader and a platoon sergeant, but shoot, yeah, I got scared. I, I, I don't mind admitting it. I, be frightened halfway out of my skin, you know. You'd be lying to say you weren't. Well, this is what I don't understand. If anybody said, oh, no, I never was scared over there, I thought either you're a liar or you never were in combat because if that won't scare you, I don't know what it would take, you know. And uh, Well, now you mentioned Bloody Ridge and them coming in. The Chinese were coming into the trenches. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, of course they did. And my guys would ask me, well, we'd just fight them off. We'd kill them. Hell, uh They'd come up there and send scouts out there and send snipers out there. And I, I hunted deer on my farm, and I would lay out there and face that north wind with a pair of field glasses, and I'd see those guys out there. And we'd uh, dream up a bit. I can give you an example. One time, these snipers kept shooting at us, and I said, I'm going to find out where those damn guys are, and I'm going I'm to get rid of them. And so uh, I laid out there, and finally one of them took his helmet off. Well, it's just like a crow landing on that snow when he took his helmet off, that old black hair. And I said, okay, I've got your butt now, buddy. And so I called back on a, a old Motorola, and I said, look where I'm telling you now. There's three snipers out here, and they've got an automatic weapon, and we're going to take that recoilless rifle, and we're going to wind them up. Well, there's a lieutenant came along there about that time, said, what are you guys fixing to do? And they said, well, the sergeant's found three guys out there are sniping us in that snow, and we're going to, you know, take care of them. And he said, what did he tell you to fire out there with? Well, I told him to use uh, antipersonnel, you know, and scatter that sh stuff and maybe get them with that. It's like number four buckshots, what it was. And he said, no, use that white phosphorus. Well, what I used that white phosphorus for mostly, if they were asking for some kind of support fire and I couldn't see it, well, we'd fire that white phosphorus. Of course, you know how that stuff, you've seen these movies, it just... And so I thought, that stuff's not worth a crap. But anyway, I'll fire it, you know, uh, if that's what they want. And I told him, I said, all right, but you keep that WP, that, that uh, uh, Anna personnel there. And as soon as that lieutenant kind of goes on, well, they didn't like to hang around where the action was. So he took on off up the trench. And my men fired a couple of rounds of that white phosphorus, and they adjusted on it. And sure enough, a piece of that stuff hit on one of those guys' back. And it set him on fire just like you'd put gasoline on him and set him on fire. Well, he ran out there and was trying to roll in the snow. Well, that's not going to get it because I had one little uh, guy, for instance, that got it in his boot, and he had to jerk his boot off and literally just took a, a, a bayonet and scraped it. And, and he's got big old scars on his legs right today from that, you know. That stuff would just eat you alive. And it gave me a lot more respect for it than I had had. I used it to mark where my shells were landing, and then I'd use... Uh, whatever, you know, kind of ammunition that I felt like we need to be throwing it, whatever we were throwing it at, you know. Well, listening to you, and I've listened to a lot of combat stories, I mean, I'm trying to imagine this as it's happening, so I'm picturing you, you're frightened, you're scared, maybe cold, I mean, 
night or day, and the, and the enemies, I don't know if they overran you guys, but are you, are you, some of the stories... Okay, let me tell you a story about being overran. Uh, we had pulled back to the back, and I had gotten a new lieutenant, and I was so thrilled because finally I was going to have a lieutenant that's going to be a platoon leader, and I was going to be the platoon sergeant and take orders from him. And he was just, had about six or seven months left to go on his uh, enlistment, and he volunteered to come over there for combat just to have that on his record, I guess. I don't know why he did it, but uh, he came and, and we were best buddies. I really got along well with him. He'd kind of keep me out of trouble if the, uh, the field grade officers kind of got on me about something I was doing. He'd always come up with some excuse why it was done like that. And he came one night about 10.30 and he woke me up and he said, uh, Pipes, I'm fixing to go up to the front. He said, they've overrun the lines. And I asked some guys the other day, I said, where was that? I don't remember. And they said, that's on the, the, the west end of Heartbreak Ridge was where that was. And he said, I'm going up there. And said, you'll bring the platoon on up there tomorrow. Well, we started up there the next afternoon because you'd always move up on the lines at night. You couldn't just go up there in broad daylight. You wouldn't last five seconds. We went up there the next day, and those guys stopped their trucks, one right behind the other, behind the other, behind the other, real close, and got out and hooked chains on them. And I thought, what in the world are these people doing? And then they put them in a real low gear, and here we went. And the one in the front put on his cat eyes, or his parking lights is what it amounted to, and we were driving on up that road, and we drove up it until we started getting small arms fire into those trucks, and the driver said, get out of the trucks, get out of the trucks. Well, we jumped out, and they jerked their chains off, and whirled around and just left us up there. And I said, all right, men, get in the ditches. Uh, get your gun set up. You know, we've got to uh, defend ourselves. And the next day, I uh, kind of made contact with the guys. Was and, and these night sounds, again, I could hear this guy talking on a... Uh, and the number SCR 300 comes to my mind, and I think that was what the old Motorola were called. The Motorola, you've seen them, these old big things with a deal and they'd talk. He was trying to make contact with somebody, and he would talk to them, and a Chinese would answer him. And I thought, well, I bet I know what happened to the guys he's trying to talk to. And they would try to send signal flares out, and we'd send up two red ones, and they'd send up three green ones or something, you know. And uh, it just, there was no communications. And so I told my men, I said, you don't move. You stay right here till daylight, and then we'll kind of hook up and uh, find out what's going on. Well, the next day... We did kind of get hooked up with the guys that were up there and had formed a line. And I said, I've got a lieutenant up here. And I started walking and looking for him. And I'd say, have y'all seen this new lieutenant? He's up there. And finally, one guy turned to him and he said, I bet that's that guy that got killed up here yesterday. And I said, what? And he said, what happened? He said, a martyr round hit almost on top of him and said, killed him instantly. And that was my little old Lieutenant Cummings that I was going to show the ropes when I got up there. He made it one day up there. And uh, the next day, there was a field grade officer. Once we had reestablished the line, he came up there and one knows who, who was in charge. And some of my guys turned around and said, Sergeant, need you over here. And so I went right up to him and I said, can I help you, sir? And he said, you're in charge? I said, yes, sir. Can I help you, sir? He said, son, how old are you? And I said, I'm 22. You know, that, I was old as a mountain at 22, I thought. And he said, well, what's your rank? And I said, I'm a corporal, sir. Can I help you? And he says, God damn, just walked off. He never did. Well, when we did get relieved and they got replacements up there because we were in reserve, we weren't even supposed to be on the front lines. Well, the captain said, perhaps I need to talk to you. And I said, yes, sir. And I went up there and I thought, Lord, what have I got into now? And he said, how would you feel about us giving you a battlefield commission? And I said, well, now, what would that entail? He said, well, we'd have a little ceremony and make you a second lieutenant because he said, I can't promote you, and I suspect this field grade officer that was down there will know why they had a little old corporal down there in charge of, you know, that platoon. And he said, of course, you'd be expected to re-up for three more years and waive your points for going home. It'd be just like you just got off the boat right here. And I said, oh, good Lord, I can't do, you know, and so I told him, I said, that, you know, is exciting, but I just cannot do that. And he said, well, I understand. And he said, you know, I can't promote you. And I said, well, I understand that too. But it wasn't too long after that till Congress apparently appropriated some money and they started letting us and 
this picture of us with these new sergeants. We were so proud we'd finally made sergeants, you know, and then 30 days later I made sergeant in first class. And I was getting ready to, we were, had gone back up on the front to the east rim of uh, the punch bowl. And that's where I was there when I came home. And uh, this uh, old captain called me back one more time. He said, you're due to go home in about a week, but would you stay 30 more days and I can send you home a master sergeant? And I told him, I said, Captain, I appreciate that, but that doesn't mean a doggone thing to me. I'm going to go home. I doubt if anybody will ever see me in my uniform. I'm going to take it off and, and, and I'm, you know, that'll be the end of it. And he said, well, if we ever have another war, I sure hope I get you back because you you made us a good soldier. And I said, well, I'm not really a soldier. I'm just, you know. And he said, you're a soldier. You know what you're doing, you know. And it made me proud that, that he thought enough of me to offer me a battlefield commission and then to want to, he said, I'll send you home at the top of your grade. You know, I'd be a master sergeant, and that's as far as you could go in the enlisted deal. But I told him, you know, I'd, and I said, when will I be going home? He said, well, within a week, you'll go home. Well, in a, within a week, well, uh, I lit out, instead of hearing all these sad stories, they, you know, going to take a sentimental journey. <laughs> I was on my way back to San Francisco. But it's funny, they put me on a ship going back. And they didn't fly me over there and fly me to California like they did. And when we did hit California, well then, and I got enough of points in that I still had about three months to go on my two-year enlistment. And they put me on that old Sunset Limited train and we chug a lug back to San Antonio and kept me there about a week and discharged me and, and, and I headed home. Well, let's go back to Korea. Okay. How, how many months were you there? I was there from... Approximately. Okay. Uh, from, uh, gosh. About a year? Yeah, a little less than a year, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of a year. And what was the worst combat? Have you already told me about it, or Bloody Ridge, or Heartbreak Ridge, or? Well, uh, you would, uh, they would, it was basically all about the same. Uh, they would uh, fire those artillery rounds and just pepper the line for maybe an hour. And then you could always tell when they were going to attack you because when they quit firing that artillery rounds, you better yell. And here they would come hollering and yelling. And I was telling Clarence out there before I got to talk to you, I know they had those guys doped up because we would have uh, uh, prisoners we would take. And one of them was sitting there one day and he had a cigarette and he was taking, uh, it looked like a grain of salt of rock salt and he'd take a twig and he'd poke that down in that cigarette and then he would light it and you could see his eyes glaze up and but you wouldn't believe the way they would attack you the first bunch that would attack you would have these old big long Russian rifles the second bunch wouldn't have anything maybe a, a box of ammunition and they'd just run along there and as we'd shoot those guys in the front they'd pick up their weapons and here they'd come with them and the third bunch maybe would be bringing a sack of rice or something. And, 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 but the trouble, and my men, I told them, if there's any way in God's world a whole Bloody Ridge and Heartbreak Ridge, because behind us was X-Ray Mountain. And that, there's no way to defend that. It would take you an hour and a half going up the reverse side up just to get to the top of it. And so we had to hold Heartbreak Ridge. We just had to. That was it. And I told them, I said, they said, well, what are you going to do when this takes place? And I said, I'll be right here beside of you. I'll be standing right here defending it just as hard as you are. And I always tried to make that a point that that's exactly what I would do. And yes, we would have not. And in fact, I've seen those guys be so doped up. They would come and they wouldn't even know they had hit the front lines. They'd just run right on past you and We've actually turned around and shot them from the back, you know. Uh, and I know they had to be doped up when they would come up there and just be screaming and yelling and blowing those old horns and act like crazy men to me, you know. And you were shooting them down? Or? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, did it seem real? I mean, it did, what you're describing almost seems surreal. It's like Well, it, it was kind of nightmarish, really. I mean, and, and, and Lord, I just... You know, I'd be so scared, I'd just be shaking. My body would just be shaking. And I don't mind telling you, I would be scared. You bet it. Uh, so, so when does it dawn on you what you're doing and what you've done? Is it after the combat where you just... 
start thinking about it? I guess so, because I never had any, of course, you know, when we would get a chance to sleep, one time when we pulled off the lines, uh, uh, I was uh, in a reserve blocking position, and they would shift you around and let you kind of get out of the combat area, and I was back there, and uh, these uh, Korean civilians, we called them uh, chuggies and chogas and such as that, they would bring up ammunition and stuff, and one of them told me, he said, Sergeant said, you changey changey today. And I said, no, I'm not changey changing. They said, Sergeant changey changey. And I thought, that guy's crazy as hell. It wasn't an hour till the captain called me and said, come on back up here at the front, I need to talk to you. He said, uh, tonight I'm gonna call your platoon up here, and we're gonna put you all in, along in front of the front lines on the outpost, the listening positions. And we're coming off of the lines. And, and it seems like it was the 7th RTC that was relieving us. And the first thing that hit me, now how did that doggone Korean that was bringing us supplies up there know that we were fixing to change each change and get off the lines? He knew it before I did. And uh, that was the worst two days, I guess, of my Army career, was being out there, left out there, while the lines were changing and the 7th was coming up and replacing our guys, you know. And there I was for two days out there with my men on that out, those outposts all across the front. And that was some scared days and nights because they were constantly sending patrols in there trying to find out what was going on. And we were constantly having to round them up and have these little skirmishes with them and so forth. And it was a heck of a darn mess, let me tell you. But finally, they sent their men out there and told me, said, okay, take your men and get off. We've got it. And we went back to the, to the lines and took the trucks and went on back to, to the rear then. But, uh, Did you lose any friends? They were oh, gosh, you? yes. Gosh, yeah. Were they with you at the time? Did you get to help them or anything? Or? No. Uh, it was uh, not that, just like this Lieutenant Cummings I was telling you about, you know, I just would find out that actually uh, once I got to be in the CP uh, Deal. I would be there for communications more than anything. We had two or three forms of communications. We had communications with the immediate rear where the big shot officers would be. And then we'd have these little, what they call sound power telephones. It's just a little old, as I recall, just a little round telephone and they'd have this uh, communication wire strung all up and down the front. And you'd talk on it and listen to it and talk on it and listen to it. That was the way you would communicate with one to the other to the other company-wide. Well, I would be in the CP, and unless something went haywire that I would need to be out with my men, I was basically in charge not too long after I got over there until I came home. Now, we would, uh, on firing these uh, recoilless rifle uh, missions and all, I'd go up there and sit with them. I'd sit right out there and take a pair of field glasses and watch what they were firing because I felt like that would build up their ego a little bit if I'd be there with them when they were doing that kind of stuff. And uh, But as far as the machine guns and that, they would have crews that would sit up there and I would relieve them. Uh, give you an example, one Thanksgiving, uh, the trucks came up there and was going to give us a special treat for Thanksgiving. And they had turkey, and it was kind of, you could tell it was old and it had been frozen and was kind of dry. But it was Thanksgiving, and they made the dressing and had the nuts that were a little bit stale. But anyway, doggone it, they were doing their best, and we uh, were eating that Thanksgiving meal. And I told one of the guys that uh, I'd go eat, and then I'd come up there. Uh, no, I told him to go eat first. That's the way it was. I said, you go eat, and I'll sit on your gun until you get back. And I was on a machine gun with him. And... Uh, I said, I'll sit on this gun with you until, uh, until you get back from eating, and then you relieve me, and I'll go down. And they'd have those darn Korean spotters and Chinese spotters or whatever they were out there, and they'd be in those rocks, and they would, could literally hear what we were saying. When this guy came back, he said, Sergeant, I've got it. You go on and eat now. And some spotter that was out there under a rock somewhere said, Sergeant, chop, 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 chop time. And I thought, I'll chop, chop your time. One time, we had a sniper that got up there real close, and he would shoot at everybody that moved. And I laid out there, and I looked, and I looked, and he almost shot the field glasses out of my eyes. And we had an artillery observer that had one of these little funny-looking things that, I don't know what they called them, but uh, 
I remember the name. It's like a periscope like thing. And I said, can, have you got an extra one of those? He said, yeah. And I said, can I borrow it? I'm looking for a darn sniper out there. And I laid out there and I looked and I laid out there and he actually was shooting at me trying to shoot that, that periscope out of, shoot the lens out of it. And finally he shot and I saw the dust fly. It was a little triangle. It wasn't any bigger than this. And he had that thing so doggone camouflaged. And, and I started, I traded in my carbine after I was up there for a while. And I told him I wanted the M1 rifle. I wanted a deer rifle. So when I shot at something, I wanted to hit it. And so when that guy shot, I said, okay, buddy, I've, I've got you spotted now. So I laid that rifle right where it was just almost aimed at him. Well, the next time somebody came by and he shot at him, he shot and I shot. And it got quiet. That's the last time that sniper ever did shoot at anybody. And that made me feel kind of eerie in a way and good in a way, too, that I finally got rid of that darn sniper. Well, of course, they didn't use that position again because they knew we knew where it was if I could shoot through that little triangle and hit that guy in there, you know. And uh, I took it back, and he said, well, did it do you any good? I said, you bet. I solved my problem. Uh, one other thing, can I tell you one more quick thing, or am I running out? No, we're, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of Okay. I never had much use for the tanks because I didn't think they'd do anything but just ride around. I was always envious of them riding around with their little heaters. I could hear them running those heaters at night and all. And, but they say they're the coldest dead gum thing in the world. But one day we had this old boy that was on this high ridge up there, and he would almost defy me. And I couldn't, by the time I'd shoot that old uh, recoilless rifle up there, well, he'd have time to be halfway, you know, under the ground by the time it would get there. Well, this tank rolled up there one day and was sitting there, and I don't know what it was even doing there. And I went over, and they all had a, a phone on the back of them. And I said, Tank Commander, can you do me a favor? He said, yes, sir, what's that? And I said, and I described the play. I said, can you look up there? Can you see a guy? He would literally wave a white flag up there. And I said, do you see that damn guy up there? And he said, yeah. And I said, can you do something about that? I've tried every way in the world to get him. Well, he just brought that old gun around and held that thing up there. And I mean, he shot that thing three or four times almost so fast I was amazed. And he literally just demolished that place where that guy was. And he said, Inventory, I don't think he'll be bothering you anymore. And that was it. That was the last time that guy was up there on that little old place and gave us any trouble. Now, you laugh about something like that, but it was kind of funny, you know. And I thanked him. I said, boy, I've got a new respect for you guys. You, you really did show me something there. Well, you mentioned nightmares. Has that bothered you since or just a long time ago? No, that's a long time ago. And I don't even... Uh, and a lot of people said it's because I've got a big mouth and I would tell anybody just what I've told you if they were interested in listening to it. A lot of people, when I'd be telling them stuff, and I probably forgot stuff to tell you that I could remember later and say, oh, I wish I'd have mentioned so-and-so. But uh, a lot of people think I was making up a lot of it, but I've never deliberately told a lie in my life that I know. I, I just, my daddy taught me, don't go misrepresenting things. Well, why do you think it's referred to as the Forgotten War, Pete, uh, Paul? I came home from the Korean War, and I asked this old bus driver that came out of Houston, taking me home up uh, where I grew up, up in Leon County up there as a kid. And I went back there and started to college. I never went back a day in my life. But I told him, I said, could you do me a favor? There's a little old motel out the edge of town. I said, my folks own that motel. Could you stop letting me off there? He said, sir, and I'd take you anywhere you wanted to go within reason you bet. And so he stopped there. And uh, my mother was standing there. She said, well, boy, there's a soldier's going to make. And I nearly cry when I think about it. She said, he's going to make somebody happy tonight. And she saw it was me. And she just ran out in the highway. And I ran and got her and told her, I said, mother, get out of the highway. You're going to get. Oh, she just tears ran down her eyes, you know. But she told me that she didn't think I'd ever make it back home. But I've got a few scratches and some shrapnel in me, and I'll set off a darn deal in a... Uh, I got thrown up against the wall down there in Houston one day when they first started doing that, and I set that thing off, and he said, what do you got that's setting that alarm? I said, I don't know, and so I looked through my pockets, and I said, I don't have anything. He said, well, come by through here again, and I did, and set it off again. And he had me up against the wall, and he told me, he said, and I laughed at him. I just thought it was the funniest thing there. Old man, you know, throwing him up against the wall. And he said, put your hands up. And I just stuck my hands up. He said, palms out, palms out. And I put my hands out. And he said, can I frisk you down? And I said, I'll take my damn pants off if you want me to. I'm not. And finally, my wife said, honey, tell him you've got shrapnel in you. 
And I said, oh, good Lord. I said, I've got some shrapnel in me. And I hadn't even thought about that. He said, where'd you get shrapnel? And I said, in the Korean War. And he said, well, have a good day. And he let me go then. But it just never dawned on me. You know, I don't think about it. I don't know. It's just a, kind of a nightmare that I've pushed out of my mind. And it doesn't, you know, I've done real well. What do you think our country should remember about the Korean War? Oh, you asked me why it was a forgotten war. I went up to get a haircut, and my barber that I had gotten a haircut for years, and it's a kind of a small town where I grew up, and he said, uh, where in the heck have you been? I don't know when. I've, I said, well, I've been in the Army. He said, where? And I said, well, Korea, we've got a war going over. Yeah, he said, I've heard. Yeah. They just didn't pay that. It, well, it was after World War II, and people were tired of wars, and I think they were a little bit disgusted at Truman for saying, we're not going to let the Russians and the Chinese take over the world one little block at a time. We're just not going to do that. And he was opposed to Franklin Roosevelt letting the Russians come over to the Far East because they didn't participate in that war at all. And he was against them even being over there. And then when they decided to go ahead and see if they could take South Korea and without the United States interfering, well, that's what they did. I will tell you a quick statistic, and you probably know this as well as I do. Percentage-wise, we lost more people in the Korean War than in any war since the Civil War. The other thing, people tell me, oh, well, you went over there later and the war was practically over when you got over there. And I said, no, that's not the case. There were more casualties the last year of that war than they were the first year of that war. And you can verify that by checking it out, too. Now, we lost somewhere between 36 and 45,000 men. I don't know. They Different people give different figures. But you figure up for the number of months that we were over there and figure out how many people that is a month, and you can come up with some pretty big doggone casualties. And you ask, you know, uh, about the casualties. Yeah, we lost a lot, of, and I lost a lot of good friends up there. I sure did. And, but you just couldn't, you know, you would wonder, you know, and I would say my little private prayers. Can I mention that? Yes. I would, I would question God, you know, why are you doing this to me? I'm a good little old guy. I've never hurt anybody. I'm, I've never done any harm to anybody. Why are you putting me in a position like this and you know I'll never make it home? I won't even last a month up here. And why are you doing me like this? And I would get mad and get, get tears in my eyes. And one day it dawned on me, you know, well, you're still here, fool. You hadn't been killed yet, you know. And then I went to say, Lord, I'm sorry, you know, forgive me for, for doubting you. And I had a change of attitude, and I, and, I, and I had the idea, nothing can kill me, doggone it. The last week that I was up there, I got this new lieutenant, and I was telling him, you know, let's walk up and down the lines. Let me show you what, what we've got going. I uh, was looking up, and I saw these martyr rounds falling. Well, that's something you hardly ever do, but I could just see them. I can see them just as well as if it was right now. There's about six or eight of them, and I said, get down, get down, and I jerked him. We got down, and they, of course, hit and exploded. And he looked at me, and he said, how did you know those mortar rounds were fixing to go off? And I said, I saw them. And he said, can you always see them? I said, no, that's the first ones I ever saw, but I could see every one of those things as they were falling. And I went on up there, and we were laying, looking across, and it reminded me of a miniature Grand Canyon there, just looking across at the bunkers. And I said, now, you see? And I pointed out two or three bunkers, and I said, that's bunkers over there, that, and that's got Chinese in every one of those. And I said, uh, you're going to have to bring a recoilless rifle up here every so often and just blow the doors off of them and destroy them and uh, destroy ammunition or whatever they've got stored up there. That's just something you're going to have to do every so often. Well, about that time, this sniper cut down, and those bullets just hit boom, boom, and they skipped me and then skipped him. And, and I told him, get back, get back. And so I grabbed him by the collar and started dragging him back, and we got back down the hill enough that uh, they couldn't see us. And he said, how did they miss us? And I said, I don't know. But again, I was saying, thank you, Lord. You're still taking care of me. You know, I'm going home in a day or two. And by golly, when I got back to the CP that time, I didn't, I just thought, well, you can find it the same way, learn it the same way I did, you know. And I didn't go back out with him anymore. But I finally got me a lieutenant just in time for me to turn it over to him and come home. Tell me what, what okay. This, I'm going to try to get these questions in, but I was asking you now, what, what should our country remember about the Korean War? And listen, 
our, our kids aren't learning it in schools today. What can we do to help educate our children and, and what can we do to learn, what should we learn about the Korean War? Well, uh, like I said, this was a test case and Harry Truman, and this I'm giving it from his perspective, and I'm a died in a hard Republican, and, but I liked Harry Truman. He was a no-nonsense president. And he, would, he said, I am not going to stand here as president and let the communist uh, nation, however you would classify China and Russia and those communists, he said, they're not going to take uh, these countries uh, each at a time. See, Japan occupied Korea for 20 or 30 or 40 years before the war, and then we told them to get their junk and get out of Korea. You're not occupying it anymore. And uh, like I said, Franklin Roosevelt told uh, Stalin, said, you can, uh, as, as my tribute to you for helping us in World War II, and I thought that's the oddest thing. We were over there helping him out keeping Germany from taking over Russia and England and the whole dang nine yards over there. He should have been thanking us and stuff. But my thinking, I was with Truman on this. I said, you know, you've got the right slant. And when they came across that 38th parallel, uh, Russia had made a deal with them. They gave Chinese the arms to furnish to uh, fight us. And they in turn gave them to the North Koreans and they told the North Koreans, said, just go and let's test them. And, and they had pushed us pretty much as far as you could. And if uh, MacArthur hadn't came in at Incheon and brought those Marines in there and cut off their supply lines, I don't know whether they would have lasted until they could train some of us to go over there and take over. But uh, they learned somewhere along the way that we had enough was enough that we're not going to allow you to start doing this. And to save my soul, I do not understand why. But, of course, we didn't have, uh, the way I heard about the Korean War, I had the radio on one day, and they said, well, Harry Truman has uh, announced that the North Koreans have crossed over the 38th parallel, and uh, he's making plans to get troops to, to stop it. I thought, oh, my Lord, I bet you I know where I'm going to be going. And sure enough, that's what... But a lot of people, you know, they were tired of hearing about war and they weren't that interested in it. And it just, you know, a little bitty country and it didn't mean anything to anybody. And they just basically chose to ignore it, you know. Just a couple more questions. Tell me, what, what does freedom mean to you? You fought the war. You, you live, we live in a country where our kids are always free. They don't know what it is to not be free. What does freedom mean to you? It means having the opportunity... I came from a little old country school that was looked down on all around the county where I grew up. I was left-handed and dyslexic and thought, and until I went in the Army and was tested and they said that I was qualified to be in officer's training, I didn't even know I had two brains to rub together. And my dad would always tell me, you know, I was left-handed, I couldn't saw a board straight and and I tried to do everything. And in fact, they found out that I was an expert rifleman. But when I started loading that gun with my left hand, they said, oh, my Lord, I keep referring to it as a gun. They would not let you use that term in the Army as a rifle. It was not a gun, but it was a gun to me because I always carried my gun when I went out to fix fences and all at home on the farm. Tell me what freedom means to you. Freedom means the opportunity to be anything you want to be. Now, that's what freedom means to me. It doesn't mean that if I've got $5 and you don't have any, I should give you three of them. That does not mean freedom to me. That is uh, socialism. Freedom means if you want to make something of yourself. I came home and I never went back to, to Centerville. I went to college, and as soon as I got out of college, it took me two years and eight months to get my first uh, degree in accounting, and I went to work for the company that's BP now. And I didn't like that job, and I had the freedom to quit, and I, the little girl that I was getting real interested in marrying, I told her, I said, let's be school teachers. And she, I said, uh, would you like, where would you like to teach school if, if, if you're in agreement with this? She said, well, my folks are from Hempstead. Well, we came to Hempstead and looked around, and I didn't care for Hempstead. I said, well, let's go over to Brenham. And just the little young kids, you know, basically right out of college and right out of 
uh, we landed here in Brenham and started teaching school. And I always, freedom is able to do the job. You're doing a job I think that you love. And when you do something that you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. That's freedom. That's freedom because you, it, and I thoroughly believe that if you didn't want to do this, you wouldn't be doing it. You'd be doing something else. And I was an accountant for the company, BP was what it was. It was Stanley Oil and Gas and then uh, Amoco and then Pan Am and, or Pan Am and then Amoco and then BP Amoco and then it's BP, a major oil company. I was an accountant for them. I hated that job and I told my wife, I said, if you'll marry me and we can both teach school and we can make a living, both of us teaching school, and that's we came to Brenham and been here right at 50 years. So, well, one or two more quick questions here. Kind of a follow-up question, um, Paul. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? The American flag means something to revere and honor. And uh, when you're saying the pledge to the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. And I try to explain that to people. They say, well, in a democracy, you ought to be, I said, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, did you ever say the pledge to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God. Now, uh, Eisenhower put that under God business into our preamble to the flag, you know, but, uh, I think it's well deserved and I think it's something that we're a Christian nation and that flag, uh, you can go back and read the history of our people that established this republic that we're talking about and uh, you can go back to old Abraham Lincoln and they were trying to quiz him and trick him up, you know, you're calling this, uh, what do you think about Texas? They're wanting to join the, he said, well, it doesn't make any difference, they're a republic just like we are. and. Uh, uh, if they stay down there and stay independent, or if they want to join us, we'll consider taking them in as part of the United States and so forth and so on. And, uh, but the flag is a, a, a symbol of, of a new way of life. Uh, you can be anything that you want to be. You've got the privilege to do it. And like I said, I went back and got my master's, and my wife and I both did. And uh, we just, we had this privilege of doing whatever we wanted to do. And we would uh, save our money for when our kids got ready to go to college. We had a fund that we could send them. And that's freedom. That's freedom. The government stay out of it and let us work and draw our money and live our free life. And that's what freedom means to me. Are you proud that you're a veteran of the Korean War? Yes, I am. I am so proud. And I, you bet. You bet. And uh, I've heard these old veterans before when I was a young man say, if I could go back and fight again, I would. And I would gladly. I certainly would. And your dad would. And I'll guarantee he would in a New York minute because he knows the difference in caving in and letting someone take over and standing up and defending. And, and, and I think it's, he knows it better than anybody. And I think I do too. People have thanked you for your service. Not that much. It's a lot of people, you know, uh, they don't, uh, a lot of people don't even know I served. You know, I ran for a county office here. I, and it can, I don't know why this needs to be on the record or off the record, but I'm the first Republican, me and a county judge, to run on the Republican ticket for a countywide office. I was a county commissioner for eight years after I retired. The first Republican since Reconstruction to be elected here in Washington County. And I think that's, you know, pretty much of a record. But, and I tell people, I didn't go around saying, now I'm a veteran, vote for me for I'm a veteran. They didn't even know I was a veteran. I didn't bother to tell them. There's a few people, I belong to American Legion. I hardly ever go to a meeting or never seen down there, but I pay my dues, you know. And, uh, but no, I don't go around saying, you know, I, I, I need privileges that you guys don't because I'm a veteran. I don't feel that way. I, just, I did what I think any American should do when the company, the country calls for you. Pack up your junk. I had a service station. I sold it and uh, sold my nice little car to my brother. And he said, well, I've got a GI Bill. I'm going to go to college while you're over there fighting. And he was graduating about the time I started, you know, when I got back home. And, uh, 
One more thing, we're almost out of tape. At the end of my interviews, uh, I asked the veteran to give me a salute into the camera. Can you do that when I ask you? You bet. Can I stand up? I don't... Well, because of the camera, if it's okay... I'm just see it? I understand the protocol. Yes, sir. Right, but it, since, if we can, just give me half a second here. Paul, look right into the camera. Give me a salute. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir.